Okay, guys, you can go ahead and remute yourself. So he says, let's go to Judea again. And they, they knew that Jesus could have healed um, Lazarus from a distance because they've seen him do it before. Uh, and they knew that going back to Judea, they just tried to kill Jesus. And they were all in danger if they went back into that region of, of Israel. So they're like trying to remind him, hey, this is Judea is a dangerous place for us. Um, so they're giving him these warnings. And Jesus says, no, we're going to go back. And he says, and he answers it with this puzzling description. Are there not 12 hours in the day? And, and basically what this means, twofold. Number one, Jesus is walking in the will of the Father. And he has said this repeatedly. All throughout John's gospel, it's not my time yet. It's not my time yet. It's not my time yet. He knew that he really couldn't be touched. And so remember all the times they had him cornered or surrounded and they're picking up stones. They're going to kill him. And he always slips through. He knows it's not his time. But there's another truth that this metaphor speaks to. Um, they're shocked that he's going to go back into Judea because they know he's a wanted man there. But he's kind of saying something that I think is an application and a lesson for us. He said, listen, guys, there's still work for me to do. While it's still daylight, I need to work. I'm here on this earth. I have certain things that I need to get done while I'm here on this earth. So it's a figurative way of trying to say this is my time that's allotted to be by my father. And I need to be about my Lord's business. I need to get my earthly work done done um so listen guys for all of us our time is i know it seems like 70 80 90 years seems like a long time it's over in the blink of an eye i bet ron can remember when he first got his driver's license probably like it was yesterday i bet linda can remember when he proposed to her and they got married and Ned, I bet you can remember when you first went into the army, just like it was yesterday. And God, look, guys, look at us now. None of us are spring chickens. Parts are falling off. Things are breaking. The wheels are coming off the, the car. But you remember that stuff like it was yesterday. Time short. And God is saying to us through the words of Jesus here. That we need to be about our father's business because time is short. And whatever God has you doing may not, maybe it doesn't seem significant to you. It isn't always about significance. You make an impact on one person's life that's significant. Um, you can see what the significance of Mary and Martha and Lazarus have thousands of years later. Do not underestimate what God is doing with you. Just get busy and be doing the Lord's work. All right, go to verse 11 through 15. But these things he said, and after that, he said to them, <laughs> our friend Lazarus sleeps. Now, they're still in Bethabara. They haven't, they haven't left yet. Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought he was speaking about taking rest as in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, blatantly in your face, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. So Jesus uses a very common metaphor uh, at the time of the New Testament. When, when, and you'll see this repeated numerous times in the New Testament. The word sleep in this application means someone has died. Um, he's describing the death of, of Lazarus. Now, initially, the disciples don't get it, so he has to spell it out plainly. Uh, but I think the metaphor is appropriate here because he knows that he is going to go and wake Lazarus up from his sleep. That he knows he is going to make him come alive from being dead. So I think it's a very appropriate metaphor here. Um, now, I'm going to sidebar something really quick for one minute. 
Uh, some people teach, and I believe this is a, uh, and I can prove that this is not correct, and it is an error, in fact, in something called soul sleep. That in essence, when a believer dies, your soul, it's like when you go to bed at night and you go to sleep. And when you wake up, it might be thousands of years later when Jesus comes and it's the resurrection that's talked about in scripture that's called soul sleep. Nowhere in the New Testament does the word sleep apply to the soul. It's always used applying to a person's body, never their soul. There is no teaching in scripture that talks about at the time of death, the soul goes to sleep. There is the complete opposite in scripture where it teaches that to be absent in this body is to be present with the Lord, to say for the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Um, uh, you know, Paul saying, I, I, I want to stay here with you, but I want to go to be with Jesus because to be with him is far better. I mean, there is nothing in the New Testament that speaks of soul sleep. And this is just an erroneous teaching that somebody has come up with. So we also see Jesus omniscience in this statement. He is still in Bethabara, 20 miles away. No new messenger has come to him. He knows Lazarus is no longer sick. He knows Lazarus is now dead. And he knew that because he's God. And he says, Lazarus is dead and I am glad. Now, some people pull that out of context. Read the rest of it. He's glad for their sakes. Why would he be glad um, for their sakes? Because he wants them to believe. Now, the disciples already believe, but that isn't what he's talking about. He's talking about you're gonna, your faith is going to massively grow here in just a, a, a little bit. So um, even though this is his dear friend. Now, Jesus, you'll see next week, he has normal human emotions, just like all of us. He loved his friend Lazarus. He's going to be overcome with that emotionally next week. But remember, he knows the outcome. He knows the grief is temporary. We will see at the end of this chapter that the grief was comforted, that, that life was restored, that many more people believed in him as Lord and Savior. And we'll see also that this sets in motion the necessary death of Jesus on the cross. All of these were reasons to be glad. Now, I want you to think about this week, based on what I started this session with in the little intro. I want you to think about this. Doesn't it seem almost cruel that Jesus let Lazarus die? Doesn't that seem mean? He could have healed him. Put yourself in a thousand conversations you've probably had over the decades as Christians. Why did Jesus, why did God allow this to happen? Why did this happen? He could have saved him. He could have done something. He deliberately let Lazarus die. Sometimes, guys, he allows our loved ones to die. And one day we will all die. Now we need to recognize it is in his timing and he has a reason and his ways are perfect and he is motivated completely by love and there is no sinister sadistic reason for this. The love is not only for the good of the individual but for the glory of God. And you have to stand on that because it's true. If none of this is true, I'm going to read you something at the end. Then we're all just wasting our time. Then Thomas, go with me to verse 16. Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, Thomas. Thomas, Thomas, Thomas. Uh, Thomas is the guy that we kick around, Right. He's the guy that we kind of go, oh, don't be a doubting Thomas. Okay. Um, I love the word, the word, the twin here. First of all, he was called the twin. Uh, and the reason for this, that we think it's church tradition. I don't, this isn't on biblical authority, but this is just what the church has handed down since the early church fathers. The church tradition is Thomas was called the twin because he looked like Jesus. 
which actually, if you think about it, if that's true, it put him at special risk. If there's any disciples that are going to get targeted, it's going to be the one that actually looks like Jesus. Case of mistaken identity. Nobody's running DNA before they shoot you with an arrow. Um, so he's called. The, now, in those days, the Jews typically had a Jewish name. So his Jewish name was Thomas. His Greek name was Didymus, which means twin. Now, I'm going to play on that in just a minute. But Thomas is the twin. Um, so he said, let us also go that we may die with him. So Thomas doesn't understand about the resurrection. Thomas doesn't. He's making these statements somewhat out of dark ignorance, but you can't fault the guy's bravery and his courage, his dedication, his loyalty. Guys, this is doubting Thomas. Do you know what the other disciples are telling Jesus? Hey, you almost just got killed there. We shouldn't go back to Judea. That, that's like a death sentence for all of us. Only one of them said, nope. Let's go and we'll die with Jesus. Only one. Our, our much maligned buddy doubting Thomas. So although he may have seen life through a negative filter, I think this shows very clearly he was a man of real devotion and a man of real courage. Let's not forget that. And here's your application. Twin, doesn't this describe us? Marty? Aren't there two Martys, a twin, Marty? The, one of your twins is a man full of faith and belief. And the other Marty is filled full of unbelief and doubt. And they look identical. I've seen them both. I can't tell them apart. Like Thomas, we are, we are all twins. I don't think this is accidental that he is known as the twin. I think there's a lesson in that for all of us. All right, let's go on to verse 17 through 22. We're getting near the end. So now finally Jesus comes, right? All this time, this has been happening, happening 20 miles away in Bethabara. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been, Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany, where he's going, was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Mary and Martha to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, so word was spreading like wildfire, she went out and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So Jesus now, there's a reason Jesus waited two days and then the journey took two days. Let me explain this. This, by the way, make it real clear. This is superstition. This was not true. This was a common superstition among Jews of the day. Their superstition is once you put somebody in the grave, the soul would hover around the body for three days. So if, you, if it goes to the fourth day, you know the guy's really dead. Okay? It was clearly just a silly superstition. But I think Jesus did not want to play into that superstition. And so he intentionally waited on the fourth day to come to Bethany and not on the third day or the second day or the first day after Lazarus' death. He waited the full four days because he doesn't want to reinforce that superstition. Now, many of the women had come from the, Jerusalem because it was only two miles away and they were surrounding Mary and Martha. By the way, we still have this tradition today at funerals, at wakes, you know, people do visits, we bring food, we, we stay with the family. It's still something that humanity needs to this day. This is happening here. Um, and the, the, the group is comprised of friends and, and family members. There would also be hired, if you didn't have enough friends and family, they would hire mourners to come and mourn with you. I know that seems a little bizarre, but they would either hire mourners to come so it was considered an important obligation, just like it is in our culture, to, to join and grieve alongside those who've lost a loved one. And Martha says to him, again, I love this, honest, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Now, she's almost stating in her disappointment, 
that Jesus delayed. Now she knew he delayed. She knew how far Bethabara was, how long it would take to walk from one place to the next. She knew he delayed. She didn't know why he delayed, but she knows he didn't come right away. And she said, Lord, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died, which is probably a true statement. But that's why Jesus didn't want to be there. He didn't want to heal Lazarus from sickness. He wanted to deliver him from death itself. Now, Mary had, uh, sorry, Martha had partial faith. She, she, she knew that he was able, Jesus is able to heal her brother while he was sick, sick and still alive. But I don't even think she realized he didn't need to be physically present to do that. He could have done it from a distance. He's done it before. And I absolutely believe she had no idea that he came there to raise him from the dead. But here's your takeaway from Martha's statement. Listen to me. You can always be honest with God. He's got very thick skin. He's, Jesus loved Mary and he loved Martha and he loved Lazarus. And he, it did nowhere along here does it say, and because Martha asked incorrectly, or was disappointed that Jesus uh, brushed her off and said, I don't love you anymore. Guys, that doesn't happen. You can be honest with God. Now, what you're saying may not be true, as in the case of Martha, but you can always be honest with God. He would rather have you say something to him that's incorrect and let him correct you than not to say anything to him at all which is what a lot of people do. Now, I like what G. Campbell Morgan wrote about this, and I'll read you because I love the way he writes. Death was no stronger in his presence than disease, but these friends did not realize this. They would think of death as the unconquerable. With disease, men may grapple and fight and sometimes overcome, but in the presence of death, men are helpless. And I think that describes what Martha, Mary were, were, were feeling. Um, he's, and she says, but I know that even now, whatever you ask of God, he'll do it for you. Here's your takeaway from this section before we close out with verse 23 through 27. Martha probably had no idea Jesus could really just raise her brother from the dead. But what she did say is regardless of the fact that you didn't come in time, regardless of the fact you didn't heal my brother, I'm still going to trust and love you despite the fact that I'm disappointed, that I'm grieving because my brother's dead. This, this guys, we'll talk about this in a minute, but you know, we beat Martha up. Do you remember the story of Mary and Martha? And Mary sits at Jesus' feet. Martha's busy in herself. And, 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 you know, Jesus kind of gently corrects Martha when Martha comes and says, Lord, tell her to do something. She's just sitting there. And he's like, Mary's chosen correctly. She's listening to me instead of busying herself with housework. And so we always make fun of Martha right along with, with Thomas. But look at the words of Martha and look at the demonstration of faith that she exercised in saying, you know what? I'm disappointed. My brother's dead. I'm hurt beyond belief. I know you could have saved him if you'd been here, but, but you do whatever you need to do. You ask God whatever you want, because I know he'll give you whatever you ask of him. She still gives this incredible statement of faith. So giving Martha some props here giving Thomas some props here. So Jesus said to her, Caesar hurt, Caesar disappointment. And guys, even when we ask him correctly or say something with God, because we're just being brutally honest with them, look at his response. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again, Martha. And Martha said to him, I, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And then Jesus corrects her and gently and says, I am the resurrection, Martha. I am the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Guys, message to us. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? 
I'm going to ask you that question. Do you believe this? And Martha replies to him, yes, Lord. In this incredible statement of faith, he, he nurtures along, he brings her along. And then Jesus, this is why I love how the Bible represents women. You know, Jesus, Martha says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who has come into the world. One of the clearest statements of who Jesus was, and it was made by Martha. Not one of the dingleberry disciples who were with him 24-7. It's made by Martha. He says, your brother will rise again. At first, she didn't understand. She knew that he would rise again in the last days. Everybody's going to rise. All the believers are going to rise again on the last day. But he corrects her and says, Martha, I am the resurrection. And I am the life. Now, listen to me. This is important, guys. Jesus didn't claim to have resurrection and life. Jesus didn't claim to understand the secrets about resurrection and life. Don't ever miss this. Jesus is dramatically states that he is the resurrection and life. To know Jesus is to have resurrection. To know Jesus is to have life. And that is our truth that we hang our hat on. Apart from Christ, there is neither resurrection nor is there life. It all hinges on that, commonly known as a linchpin. On, on that, everything turns. Now, he challenges Martha to trust that he's the source of eternal life. He presents himself as the champion over death. Now, humanity in general, and I understand this, humanity, humanity in general fears death. Of course they do. It's final for them, but the Christian can only fear dying, not death. You see, the believer will never dwell in death. For the believer, it's simply a doorway, an instant transition from an old life to a new life. So don't fear death. You can fear dying. I get that. But don't fear death because it holds no power over you. Death, where is thy sting? For you, it has none. Um, Charles Spurgeon wrote this, and I'll read this quote. Love Spurgeon. Death comes to the ungodly man as a penal infliction, but to the righteous as a summons to his father's palace. To the sinner, death comes as an execution, but to the saint, death comes as an undressing. Death to the wicked is the king of terrors, but death to the saint is the end of those terrors and the commencement of glory. Love that. That's goosebumpy. Love how Spurgeon quotes that. So also, Jesus makes this incredible, ridiculous, extraordinary claim. Guys, this, again, either he's a fruitcake who's claiming to be a refrigerator or he is who he says he is because only God can say, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Whoever believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Only God can make a statement like that. And by the way, I told you at the beginning of John, way back 100 years ago in the intro, there's going to be, I think, seven I am statements. This is the fifth one where he uses that word Yahweh, which is the same word God uses to reference himself. And then he challenges Martha with a simple question. Do you believe this? He's not asking, asking her to make intellectual assent with this. He's not asking her to get into a philosophical or theological debate. He's saying, Martha, do you believe that this is true? And this is the key, again, for us today, to eternal life for us today. Who do we say Jesus is? Do we believe, guys, do you guys believe that he is the resurrection and the life? Now, again, no, I don't, I think I won't go down that rabbit hole. Does that mean that Jesus wasn't going to raise Lazarus unless Martha believes? Some people teach that unless you, you know, make positive confession about something, God is powerless to accomplish anything and you've just thwarted his plans. God help us. 
God help us. If God is that inept and powerless that you have to use a special incantation or certain words for God to do something that he's intent on doing, God help us, then we don't serve an almighty God. Again, anything that places the emphasis on you, an emphasis on something you do instead of on what God does is generally speaking the wrong emphasis. So how does, how does Martha answer? Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who has come into this world. She answered correctly. Martha, like Thomas, uh, always getting the bad rap as we talk about them, exhibits this clarity and this understanding, which is beyond almost any of her peers, including the disciples. Jesus was and is God in human form among us, that he is indeed the Messiah, the Christ. Others may doubt, others may persecute, Others may deny, but Martha stands up and declares, I believe. And notice this, guys. She made the declaration before Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. All right, take yourselves off mute. All right, you guys with me? Yeah. Yes. All right. So yes. we had the we had the kind of heavy intro. I'm going to close with a reading you a scripture verse as your main message. Paul, the apostle Paul, wrote in 1 Corinthians 15 the following. Now, I'm going to read to you out of the message. Well, normally, I don't read out of the message. It is a paraphrased version of the Bible, not a verse-by-verse -verse translation. But it reads really well, and it captures the essence really well. This is what Paul writes. Now, let me ask you something profound yet troubling, Paul says. If you became believers because you trusted the proclamation that Christ is alive, risen from the dead, then how can you let people say that there's no such thing as a resurrection? Because if there's no resurrection, there's no living Christ. And face it, if there's no living Christ and there's no resurrection, then everything we told you is nothing but smoke and mirrors. And everything that you've staked your life on is also smoke and mirrors. Not only that, but we'd be guilty of telling you a string of barefaced lies about God, all these affidavits that we passed on to you, verifying that Christ uh, was risen from the dead, they would all be nothing but sheer fabrications. If, if corpses can't be raised, then Christ's wasn't. And then he's still dead. And if Christ weren't raised, then all you're doing as Christians, listen to me, all you're doing is just wandering around in the dark. You're as lost as ever. It's even worse for those who died in hope of Christ and resurrection because it's too late for them. They're already in their graves. If all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for a few short years that we're here on this earth, then we're a pretty sorry lot. But the truth is that Christ has been raised, the first and a long legacy of those who are going to leave the cemeteries. This is talking about Lazarus. This is talking about raising him from the dead. That's what we're camped out on in chapter 11. And this, guys, is the bottom line. If there is no resurrection power in Christ, then go home, turn off your YouTube, turn off your zoo, go home, drink, eat, and be merry because tomorrow you die. There's no point to your life. There's no point in, in tithing and in serving others and giving your life for others and, and doing works of helps or any of this. Why spend hours a week? You know, going to church and listening to a Bible broadcast, you're a sorry lot. You're all fools if this isn't true. 
But this story shows us that Christ can resurrect the dead. It, that this is the case after all. Jesus can make alive what was once dead, and we can all look forward with hope and joyful anticipation to the life that awaits all of us. It is this hope that sustains us. Um, some of you, you may have not such a great experience with this life on earth. Matter of fact, it might feel like hell on earth. But guys, this isn't all there is. There is more. There is much more. And this story of Lazarus paints that picture of hope that sustains us beautifully. All right, any comments or questions about today's portion of teaching? Next week, we'll go over the actual raising of Lazarus, and there's a lot more to unpack. Here in Martha's response gives me great encouragement. This is before the Holy Spirit came, her statement. And to make a statement like that, wow. <laughs> wow. And Dana, before her yeah. brother was even raised. Now, yeah. be one thing that, okay, after he's raised, she makes that prop. Oh my gosh, you really are. But she did this before the event yeah. actually occurred. Yeah. It's incredible. It's it Don't is. beat up on Martha. Stop yeah. beating up on Thomas. <laughs> Other comments? Lord, I believe. Help Lord, my believe. unbelief. Yes, amen. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say that, yes. God, there's so many nuggets in this. We can be honest with God. It's all him. It's not about us. And he's got a plan. He's got a plan for each one of you. And each one of you is important. And he loves each one of you. And he's good. And he's all powerful. And you can come to him with your needs. Uh, we don't know if it's going to be a no or a yes or a wait. And sometimes the no and the yes are hard to distinguish from each other. But keep coming and keep asking until he tells you no. Until the person dies. And that's obviously a no. Stop praying for them. Um, and don't question him. Know that he loves you and he's good. He's not capable of doing wrong. And there are things and events that can happen. I used to write stories for you guys. And I came up with one where, you know, people would die or something tragic. And, and you know, 250 years later, something incredibly good happens because of something that happened, you know, four or five generations prior. And there's no way they would know that's coming. But God sees all that. He lives outside of time. Yesterday, the future, today, it's all the same to him. He knows exactly where all the puzzle pieces fit, where all the chess pieces are supposed to go, how they're supposed to get played. He knows all of this, and he never makes a wrong choice, and he always does the right thing, and we can hang our hat on that. So come to him with your needs. Be honest with him. But when you don't get the answer that you want, understand that he still loves you, and he's right there with you. And he's going to walk through that trouble, that grief, that hardship with you because he's got a better purpose because he said no. All right. I see a lot of nods. Five minutes, no other questions. And I'm going to sign us off. Looking, looking. Okay. One of my prayer requests is that... My single story home is not the one that's behind Marty's head. <laughs> I'm going to close this out. Close this out this week, Lord. Thank you very much for letting us gather together. Thank you very much, Father mm -hmm. God, for this class and the people's faithfulness and attending and giving them ears to hear mm -hmm. and a soft heart to receive what your word has for us, Lord. We thank you the Holy Spirit led today. We thank you, Father God, that we are still alive and kicking and breathing, and we want to remember our brothers and sisters that expressed needs at the beginning of this class. We want to remember them this week. Father God, help bring them to our remembrance. Help bring them to our hearts this week. We just ask that you would return us all here safely next week to hear more of your wonderful and awesome word. In Jesus' name, we ask. Amen. 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 And amen. All right, gang. I'm one minute over the 115 deadline. I will see you later. See you next week, everybody. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you yes. for joining us. Thank you. Enjoy your time, Marty, in Switzerland. That looks awesome. I, uh, <laughs> I learned in Switzerland. <laughs> Good. Bye-bye. They have Bye. great cheese there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Bye, guys. Bye.
Bye.